Tim, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? Last time I saw you, I think may have been on the streets of Japan uh, in a snowball fight. Where do we find you today? Uh, live in the Bay Area, um, just south of San Francisco. And um, thanks to COVID, uh, I'm still uh, working in home. Well, you know, you and I were kind of BSing before the episode starts, and uh, we're going to talk about all sorts of fun things, blockchain, Coinbase related, uh, real estate as we get into the show. But um, you've kind of been a CFO for a lot of companies in, in Silicon Valley, the Bay Area. But uh, I want to hear a little bit of your origin story. In particular, you mentioned there's a uh, completing the circle. One of the one of the companies was Co Covad, not COVID, Covad, but pretty close, right? Mm -hmm. Was this was this a biotech company? What were they doing? No, no. Covad uh, was the uh, was a company that, uh, that I, I was number five employee. I uh, got my offer on a park bench. It's kind of interesting. And um, there was no room in the little uh, shared space that we had at the time. And it was uh, quite a quite an idea. It was part of the uh, it was a competitive local exchange carrier. So a telecommunications company that helped bring broadband to people's homes. This is when you used to be able to get uh, one megabit per second connection in the office. But when you went home, you had a dial-up modem and you were getting 19 kilobits per second and you know the, the computer screen would, would paint slowly. Uh, we brought a, a, a megabit uh, in, into your home uh, over copper lines. So, um, so that was really the genesis and the, and the, the background be, behind COVAD. Uh, today, if we had that name, I'm sure the stock would have tanked, but um, it was- <laughs> You uh, never know. I mean, you know, some of these tickers sometimes, it's always fun to watch the- inefficiency of markets where the wrong ticker uh, will will uh, get a ton of interest and volume um, intentionally or not. But yeah, uh, yeah. we had well, interesting. To... that that company. Um, it was a startup. Uh, Warburg Pincus was a was uh, the primary sponsor and they rarely do seed round investments. They but they did this time and made uh, a huge return. Uh, when I left, it's, when I joined, it was a five million dollar market cap. When I left, it was over 12 billion. Wow. Um, the company grew from five when I joined to uh, when I left, it was over 3000 people nationwide. Uh, we had done over about $2.7 billion worth of financing and every kind of financing structure you can imagine. In fact, we went public with debt before we went public with equity, which re was really interesting. So we did something called a 144A transaction, which was a high yield debt deal that uh, we had six months to then register with the SEC. So unlike a lot of IPOs these days, where you're kind of caught on the blocks with the SEC giving you, uh, uh, you know, kind of the economy reviews and legal reviews of your S1, and you're kind of up against the wall and you have to make a lot of concessions at the last second, we had six months to do it. So when we went public with equity, so we had public debt, when we went public with equity, we had no comments because like, we already traded. So that, that was a super fun time. Like I, I said earlier, that was... Uh, my first once in a lifetime opportunity, and I've had a couple since. You might you might be one of the only could be the first. I'm not even sure, but but it's certainly very few CFOs that have been on the show over the years. Um, how does well, like what like what, you've done this a number of times at this point? But but back to the early days, like how how does one get into the CFO role? Is it like you're at a small startup the first time? Is what I'm referring to, um, you know? And they're like, uh, we need a CFO. We're just going to promote you, Tim. But like, what what was the what was the or like how yeah. how does one start being a CFO? In interesting. So um, great great question. A lot of people think CFOs come up through the CPA ranks or public accounting. Actually, about only 25% of all CFOs uh, really kind of cut their teeth that way. I'm not a CPA. I'm not an accountant. I understand accounting. I've managed uh, accounting departments uh, over the years. And um, I rely on having a chief accounting officer or a very senior CPA that's supporting me. But uh, how I came up uh, through... I, 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 Got my MBA after business school. Um, got uh, worked for a large um, chemical company called Union Carbide, uh, based in Danbury, Connecticut. I was on their M and A team doing global restructurings and and M and A. Um, long story there. There was a gas product uh, explosion in India, Bhopal, India, and that whole company kind of turned on its head. So I actually was looking for a job on the East Coast. I found uh, a role uh, in the corporate finance uh, department of a large insurance company, Liberty Mutual in Boston. They eventually moved me to Los Angeles uh, to be their 
divisional controller for the Pacific Division. At the time, it was about a half a billion dollar business. Now it's probably tens of billions. Um, but I start, you know, I was I was really a, a student of corporate finance. I loved corporate finance. That was my just my favorite topic. Uh, that in the money system. And so um, I'll make this quick, but um, you know, that led to an engagement in, in a small boutique um, venture firm uh, that was doing actually backing uh, LBOs. Um, and that then led to, that was back when Milken was doing, you know, Drexel was doing a lot of LBOs. Um, we were a small firm uh, supporting that. And then I uh, got a, got a call from one of the equity providers that was investing in several of the deals that we sponsored and they recruited me to the Bay Area. That's how I moved to San Francisco. And uh, it's then, you know, Silicon Valley was kind of the panacea of places I you know, ultimately wanted to live. And, and I got fortunate enough to work for a private equity firm here. And that just led to an introduction. So lots of um, modeling, forecasting, understanding controls, process, um, everything needed for acquisitions. And then uh, ultimately, I got a call from a business school buddy at Intel who uh, they were breaking out of Intel. Um, uh, three people came out of Intel and, and started this telecommunications company. And um, they asked me to be CFO. And it, it, uh, that's how it started. For for a little timeline perspective, I'm just curious where to place you um, in the majority of your CFO ventures in the Bay Area. Was this have been 90s? Was this post uh, internet bust in the 2000s? I imagine it was it was both. Uh, this was just putting in time horizon. This was in the mid 90s. Um, the company went public. Um, the company Covad, excuse me, went public in 1999. And then ultimately did seven follow-on offerings uh, over the next three years, both equity and debt. So um, you got to see, you've seen a fun perspective of, you know, Silicon Valley, the, obviously the late 90s. So um, I used to come out and visit when I was in university, late 90s, and it was just like champagne, champagne flowing freely. Uh, I lived in Lake Tahoe when... Google was still a private company and they used to rent out the entire mountain there in the early, you know, 2000s, got to see that um, craziness. And then here we have now, like, you know, I don't even know which Silicon Valley 3.0, 4.0, whatever it may be over the past few years. Um, what are some of the similar rhymes you've seen over the years? Like do it, where we are now in 2022, does it feel... Uh, normal? Does it feel like total boom times? We're recording this in April. Um, does it feel uh, any rhymes to the 90s? Uh, so from someone who's been in it, what's the, give us the lay of the land. Yeah, I've seen, you know, I've, I've seen my fair share of boom bust cycles. Uh, they called it the go-go years, I remember back in that boom cycle. And um, there are a lot of similarities to the, um, to the frenzy behind uh, equity investors and debt providers jumping on board of, of high growth companies. The, the similarities are that there's this, it seems like there's this wave that takes place, you know, every six to eight years of, um, of new technology that no one ever thought of six to eight years ago, right? And, uh, you know, six to eight years from now, there's going to be an, another wave. Uh, you know, we're talking about the metaverse and, you know, NFTs and things that people just can't even wrap their minds around today, it'll be commonplace, I'm sure, in, in 10 years. So, um, you know, what, what, I, what I've seen consistently over my career and, and working, you know, with capital markets, investment banks, technology uh, providers, venture capital firms, you name it, is that there's a, um, there's a, there's this kind of up and to the right trend uh, company, there's more and more capital supporting more and more ideas. The the way that uh, ideas get germinated uh, really has changed quite a bit. And yeah, you know, that's the beauty of living in Silicon Valley is, you know, unlike say LA where you live, you know, the backyard barbecues, we, we talk about, you know, venture ideas and the next play and maybe LA, they're talking more about the next movie script. So um, it's a, it's a fascinating time. There's always that cycle where things go, go dark. Um, I recall driving through San Francisco in 2008 with 
you know, every other building had a for lease or a for sale sign. Mm -hmm. Kicking myself now that I didn't buy a few of those uh, mm -hmm. those 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 buildings for for peanuts. But yeah, I, I would imagine that there's another one of those cycles ahead of us or more. Um, and I would say, COVID and work from home that has slowed things down, but I don't think it's uh, it's disrupted it. Um, obviously, we're all seeing limitations on travel and the ability to to grow but you know the venture community is 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 alive and thriving although this this quarter um you know, we just the company I'm with now we just closed a series B and that was fortunate given uh Q1 has been a, a significant downturn in venture investing and um you know the, the venture investors there's more of them there's what 9000 of them or so today um there's so much capital that's on the sidelines ready to be put to work and there's so many great ideas. The hard part is finding people, people to run your know, operators to run these companies. And you know, we're experiencing that now on the on the tech side. Even accountants are they're hard to find. So yeah. I would say that um, you know the rhymes, as you say, are are uh, are many. Um, it's a fascinating time. Um, you know, it, I, I don't care about Silicon Beach or uh, you know venture firms in New York or Israel or wherever. Uh, most venture investing is still here in the Bay Area, and um, the beauty of of being able to telecommute is you can hire people anywhere. So, you yeah. know, current company we have people all over the country. What um before we uh, before we dive into blockchain and Coinbase, one last question to me: um, uh, the CFO role to me always seems uh, like, from my perspective, fraught with anxiety. I'm always uh, I'm always panicking that someone's doing something wrong and like I'm going to be at the uh, the risk from somebody mucking something up I mean the CEO role same thing uh, but but in a different way um, how much of like the CFO role in some of these bigger companies is is kind of templated meaning like look here's the rules follow this stuff like it's just black and white and how much is is um how much art and creativity is there? And, and what I'm thinking about is like you talked about the company going public with debt earlier or the decision, uh, you know, some of these huge levers which impact these companies for years, if not decades, survival versus, um, you know, going belly up and not making it. Some of the, the old book, The Outsiders talked about this. They're like, everyone's always focused on the sexy part of running a business, the developing new products and do you have product market fit and, and research and development, but they're like at least half, if not more of the success of the company is determined by uh, the financing decisions and how you um, kind of manage that side of the business. T just tell me a little bit about any, uh, you know, from someone who's been in CFO, CFO role so many times, any general thoughts, misconceptions when it comes to what you do versus how, how popular people think about it? Sure. Well, that's a, that's a, it's a great question. It's a broad question. I think the answer is, you know, there's a lot of different dimensions there. Depends on really what type of company you're with, what stage they're at, what their growth uh, opportunities are, what the market size is, and just wh where they are in that, that whole you know, financial sponsorship, et cetera, um, growth rates. And if you're an earlier stage company, and you're not bound by uh, public scrutiny, you know, being public with, you know, Reg FD and other disclosure requirements, you know, the certification of financial results and all of that. That's that's what kind of puckers you up and you know puts your hair on end. You know, the the CFO, like the general counsel of most companies, are typically the last hires into tech companies, mm. because, like you said, the initial thought is, you know, germinate an idea, pitching it to an investor bringing on a product team, typically engineering team to build the product. Then it moves into, you know, kind of pre-revenue uh, marketing, getting, getting the word out, and then, then moving into revenue and, you know, identifying the product market fit. All this time, they're accumulating all this debt, this administrative debt, both on the finance and accounting and people or HR side, as well as legal. And so, what I end up doing, uh, having been CFO of now nine companies, I typically have been the first CFO in a company, but I come in after they've proven their revenue and they've actually got a, 
um, kind of a, a focus on the on the market. Uh, the the gr there's growth there. I can I can see a path to to growing, but we're the you know the the general counsel and CFO are the the goalies on the soccer team, right? We're we're preventing goals from being scored against us. Everybody else is out there scoring goals, and it's great. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of uh, CYA that that we, we have to do. And as you get closer and closer to being a public company, the um, it's uh, I, I came up with my my own axiom, which was uh, Tim Way. He's uh, uh, confluence of interest between investors and operators and. You, know, you sit in board meetings at an early stage company and the, you know, the board members are and investors have lots of ideas on how to help you. And, you know, they, um, they have issues on compensation dilution. We've got to you know, work all that out. And, you know, as you get closer and closer to an IPO at the moment you go public, you have complete alignment on interest. The minute after the IPO, you start diverging again. And within three months, all those investors are off your board. And so, it really depends on where you are in that life cycle, and um, you know the the the, the areas that um, that co pre-public companies that uh, want to be a public company. Some companies don't; they want to stay independent or want to be acquired. Uh, but if you want to stay independent and 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 go public, there's a lot of reasons to go public. Um, you have to go through a, a control build process, and actually, I'm going through this right now. Uh, this is now the fourth time I'm doing it, and it's it's a two to three year process, and it's between three and five million dollars for a typical tech company. Um, you usually have to bring in experts in systems design, process design, control design, and all of this comes together over time. Looking at the different processes, like order to cash, for example, defining the specific and very very tight elements of all the steps in the order to cash process or quote to cash process. Uh, the same with procure to pay, record to report or equity or revenue, you name it, hire to retire. All these processes need systems, they need process, they need controls that you can test and test and prove they work. And then when we do go public, public investors are going to want us to certify that those controls do work, that I participated in the design of those controls. And in fact, they work. And you certify it through a 302 disclosure or certification, and, and a, then ultimately a 404 to certification, and then ultimately your auditors have to certify that those controls work. And you move beyond a evidence-based audit to more a of a um, of a systems-based audit, so where the controls are built into the systems themselves. So this is a um, there is art and there is science. Uh, it, it's uh, a lot of times. Um, leadership teams at these earlier stage companies have never been through this before. And so part of my job is to educate them on, on just what it takes and how it's going to impact their world. And then ultimately investors, hopefully they're, they've been through enough cycles where they've, they've invested in earlier stage companies that eventually do go public and they know what has to happen. I say, you know, the way I, I look at it is, if you know what the end zone looks like and you've been there and you've scored touchdowns before, you're, it's a lot more comfortable than the first time you had the ball on the one yard line. This is just a curiosity. That in the very rare event that a um, CFO gets in trouble, company gets in trouble, a CFO gets dragged into it. Does it is it traditionally because the CFO um, is young and naive and inexperienced, doesn't know what they're doing, or is it more often than not that the company slash uh, CFO is doing something where it's like pushing the the boundaries of trouble. Like, is there uh, any sort of generalization there? Because um, when I read about, like, when you read about things in the journal or whatnot, I'm always curious. It's like, was was for most cases, this person just doesn't know what they're doing, uh, or is it more that their people are trying to be a little too too smart for their own good? Uh, that, that's a tough question because there's so there's such a broad uh, spectrum of types of companies that some are extremely complex business models. They have multiple legal entities. They operate in multiple countries with different currencies. So the operating models get quite complex. And a, you know, if you're just a single legal, legal entity and you're operating in one country with one currency, uh, it's a lot different. If you're private, um, the chances of getting in trouble, so to speak, are, are much less because private investors don't typically like to sue the companies that they own. 
Yeah. Um, but when you go public, it's a whole different story. You've got um, you have shareholders that you know there's class action lawsuits. If you have guidance incorrectly, um, you know. Fortunately for me, I haven't been in hot water, but yeah. uh, there's you. The CFO and CEO have to work closely with the board in setting earnings guidance, both revenue and earnings on a quarterly basis when you're when you're public. And the 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 trick there is to come up with a beat and raise model. So you give guidance to the street on a number that you expect to hit or a range that you're going to hit for both uh, top line and bottom line. And then uh, our job is to not um, not disappoint. And if we uh, get too enthusiastic and give, a, uh, give out guidance that we, we miss, uh, stock's going to tank depending on how much you miss. If you miss it two quarters in a row, you're most likely in the doghouse for a few years. And you have to earn back trust and confidence. So companies that uh, go public really need to know how to forecast themselves. They have to have predictable businesses. And, um, and if, you know, obviously, the more complex it is, you're going to be giving out more and more guidance, especially if you have multiple business segments that get reported separately in your, in your public disclosures. So yeah, I would say that it's, you know, there's always uh, bad actors out there. Um, I can't imagine why anybody would do that the the, right. the something called section 11 liability which is criminal and you could go to jail people are crazy um, tim that's the whole point is like they get they get their incentives all mucked up but yeah um, money, I, money does drive a lot of uh, bad decisions so um you bound you d- you did a few cfo gigs worked in all sides of the spectrum on uh taking companies public uh you know and and um from tiny size all the way to what we would call today a decacorn. Um, what came first, if we think about this in terms of like chicken and egg, did uh, Tim getting seduced by the blockchain and crypto come first and that led you to Coinbase or was Coinbase the, um, the entry drug that got you to blockchain <laughs> and uh, crypto? How, so what was the origin yeah, story yeah, with, with syncing up great, with Coinbase? This is a great story, and it'll be part of my book when I write it. The, the Coinbase experience was so fascinating. I uh, literally um, levitated my way to work every day um, in the financial district in, in San Francisco. But I got a call from a recruiter, um, and I get calls you know, several times a week, um, and this one said, just asked, do you, do you know who Coinbase is? And I said, no. And they said, do you know anything about Bitcoin? And I said, no. And do you know anything about uh, crypto exchanges? And I said, no. Uh, so obviously, it was a, I'm a perfect fit. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, uh, I'll spare you the details, but I had um, uh, a couple of intro calls with their head of operations, uh, then ultimately their chief legal officer, who they both like me. Uh, I, I bring, so the, the interesting thing about being a CFO is our skills, especially tech CFOs, our skills are fungible. And typically tech CFOs don't, don't stay in a company more than three to four years uh, just because there's a sweet spot. Like my sweet spot is late stage private to early public. Um, and then there's, you know, I'll hand it off to people that love being public company CFOs. Uh, but the, the, the thing is the, my skills are very fungible and transferable and, I would say with Coinbase, like just like where I am now, um, the the industry is, and knowing the industry is probably between ten and twenty percent of the role. The rest of it is all of the other operational mechanism and plumbing that has to be put in place. And so I was quite confident that I could help uh, Coinbase fix its finance department, and. Um, I met with Brian Armstrong, funny story around the interview. I was late because there was an accident or whatever on 101. And um, I thought that was it. I'll never, I'll never get hired here. But apparently I was so out of breath uh, by the time I <laughs> ran to the office and Brian really likes people that listen versus talk. Mm-hmm. And um, because I was out of breath, I couldn't do much talking. And so mm-hmm. at the end of the interview, he told me how much he liked how we communicated. Uh, mm-hmm. which was just just fascinating. But but anyway, um, I made it through the, the interview process and I you know, joined them. And this was in late 2017. I was there 
you know, a year and change. And I was brought in to Coinbase specifically to build and manage their global financial operations and, and help them build their, their financial initiatives. And interestingly, when I was there, it's top line grew over 60 X the year before I got there, uh, they did $17 million of net revenue. When I left, it was nearly a billion. And so truly an exceptional time. Um, the leadership team had never been through that kind of scale before. There were all kinds of early stage issues. Um, so I helped transform that company and the control environment from a, from a startup, just a raw startup to a well-run mature organization and capable of continued profitable growth. Uh, and they were profitable at the time, which is really interesting, throwing out free cash flow at the rate of, I probably shouldn't get into it, but think of it like a series C financing every day going into the bank. Um, you know, when I arrived there, the state of the finance department was non-existent. It was really three people and a dog. Uh, and they were, none of them were qualified for the job. Um, I helped organize and develop uh, robust uh, accounting controls and accounting capabilities. Uh, built and grew an international tax function. The company was international. Established a global treasury function. We worked in multiple fiat currencies and had billions of dollars of, of our customers' cash as well as our own cash to invest. Uh, there was no treasury function. I developed their first comprehensive budgeting and reporting capabilities. There was no fp a or budgeting. Um, and also during that time, I helped build global banking relationships. And people probably don't, know this, but banks didn't want us. We got debanked by one, one bank, I won't mention who, and we were literally working, when I joined, working with shopping mall banks with, you know, very small um, capital bases, and we represented a, a large part, probably, you know, bank regulators wouldn't have liked that. Um, so part of my goal was to build banking relationships, and to do that, I needed to understand crypto compliance, security, the regulatory restrictions, all of that to be able to talk to the bank, um, the bank AML and KYC teams that were you know, onboarding companies. Ultimately, we were able to, and I, I probably shouldn't mention the names, but sign you know, relationship banking relationships globally with you know, large money center banks. The other thing I did was build uh, their global insurance coverage. So we um, we were not only um, providing FDIC insurance to fiat balances held, but also ensuring um, our, our customers' crypto balances that were not in cold storage. So hot wallet, think of a hot wallet as a bank teller's tray and cold storage is the vault in the basement of the bank. So um, we, were, we were ensuring that hot wallet and um, that hot wallet grew from about $20 million when I joined. It grew to 50 million within a month or two and then it was well over 100 million within six months and the insurance market just couldn't support us. So we actually went out and built our own captive insurance company. So I had to learn a lot about uh, crypto regulation, security, compliance, et cetera. It was um, quite, quite a fascinating time, but that's how I got introduced to the company yeah. and learned a lot about, I mean, I became just a student of crypto. It was fascinating. Um, and- I, I um, I, I was going to say, because like, you know, that time period, you, you talk about the rules being written. I mean, it's like the rules were being written in real time. It's not like you had a playbook for a lot of these um, crypt, crypto regulations, which still today, you know, I feel like it's an ongoing work in progress from a lot of the uh, sovereigns, but also, you know, everything from banks, to state governments, all, all in between. Um, so it's pretty magic when you see a company service or product have that sort of product market fit. And it just does that rocket ship, you know, um, uh, moonshot growth. And it's just, it's just magical to watch um, when everything's hitting. And, and it seems like this was very much the story, you know, kind of as you were there and, and helped this um, build out for the two people listening that don't know, what Coinbase is and what it's like main business today um, is. Give, give us a little overview of uh, maybe then to now, uh, but anything that's different today than versus a few years ago, but what the, what the company really does, what's the sure. main muscle movement on how it makes, makes so much moolah? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I'd like to come back to the regulatory uh, framework sure. and that that at, at some point because personally I think that is the biggest risk factor in, for not only Coinbase but for the entire crypto sector, and that's worth you know dedicating a little bit of this conversation to. But the Coinbase business at its core, it, it it's very simple. It's an online platform for buying, selling, transferring, or storing digital currency. Uh, when I joined Coinbase, this mission was to create an open financial system for the world. I don't know if it's still the their mission, but it's an important theme when we talk about valuation uh, because it, it's kind of contrary to where, where the company's going. But uh, it was the company's founded in, in 2011 by uh, Brian Armstrong, a former Airbnb engineer who worked in the fraud group at, at uh at Airbnb, it was funded by Y Combinator. It um, in 2012, it launched its first service, and the concept was super simple: to make it easy to buy and sell and store Bitcoin. That was it. So at the time, buying and selling crypto through exchanges was really difficult and required a, a level of expertise that many people didn't have. And Brian did something really simple. I mean, he he read the Satoshi white paper for Bitcoin, got fascinated by it, and he built a simple software interface. Like think think of it as a wrapper that allowed customers to trade crypto on different exchanges. And you know, he wanted trading of Coinbase to be an extremely e easy process and geared toward the beginner. That was how the company started. It was a simple buy crypto button, <laughs> really easy on your, on, your, on your smartphone. You can enter a dollar value or place a market order uh, for whatever crypto asset you choose, you chose to, to trade on their platform. And at the time, there were only four cryptocurrencies that traded on Coinbase, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and Bitcoin Cash, which was a kind of a rocky rollout. Um, and I can get into now they have, you know, 85 or more uh, cryptocurrencies that they, that they trade. And they're, they're launching an NFT platform also, but that, that's for a later conversation. But that buy crypto button gave an op, uh, the, the customer an option to um, to buy or sell or convert crypto or even set up recurring orders. So it was super easy and geared toward the beginner. So the main, their, their main product at the time, which is now called Coinbase Consumer, um, it, it not, only, uh, you know, not only offered a simple trading uh, interface, but there was no downloadable software. Um, it was all browser-based. It uh, included uh, advanced uh, trading. And, and, and then they, I'm sorry, they, they, expanded that uh, platform into a more advanced trading platform called Coinbase Pro. And Coinbase Pro was, was it's really was built for the kind of the, the crypto day trader that was more sophisticated and wanted more charting options, that type of thing. Users had the option to send and receive cryptocurrencies from other exchanges uh, into in, what from other exchanges or onto a, a, a a storage device, or you can write down your private key on a piece of paper, um, but you could transfer your, your crypto in and out for free into your Coinbase wallet. And so uh, users, you know, they sent crypto out of their Coinbase wallets and they received crypto, you know, like I said, from other exchanges into their wallet. And the other thing that's really separated uh, Coinbase from others at the time, and I still think it does, is that they were an on-ramp and an off-ramp from fiat to crypto and then from crypto back to fiat. So a lot of people are making millions of dollars in, um, in cryptocurrencies, but good luck getting it you know, deposited into your Bank of America account. That's uh, extremely difficult. And many firms like Binance won't allow that. You have to actually only trade on the Binance platform and then you can move your crypto to another platform to offboard it or off ramp it into fiat. So, you know, what at the, at the core of that, that sounds simple, but compliance and security are so important. You know, Coinbase has never been hacked. You might've heard of the Mt. Gox uh, mm -hmm. debacle where, you know, a couple hundred million of crypto was stolen. In fact, I think there was one recently that I just read about the New York times a couple months ago. Couple, a couple got arrested for, you know, they, they stole, I don't know, a few million dollars of, of, of crypto and then held it for so long, it became worth $4 billion or more. Mm -hmm. And then they tried to move it around and that's how they got busted. But um, security is extremely important. It's really embedded. Compliance and security are embedded into uh, into, into Coinbase. But to, to kind of wrap up your question, that's where how it started. And 
It's grown quite a bit. There's a lot of other products. Uh, today, Coinbase operates in over 100 countries. It has 21 products that can be divided into really three buckets, one for individuals, one for businesses, and one for developers. Um, you know, individuals is, like I said, Coinbase Consumer, Coinbase Pro, Coinbase Wallet. They have a USD coin, which is a stable coin. And then on the business side, there's a, a product called Coinbase Prime. When I was there, we acquired a prime broker. And the reason we did that was we were worried that the SEC was going to determine that that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies were in fact securities. And if they deem that, and we thought at the time it was, you know, the ruling was going to come out momentarily, but if they deemed that, we would have been shut down. And so what we did is we built a prime brokerage operation that met all the the requirements, regulatory and compliance requirements as a prime broker. Um, and uh, you know, I actually put that business case together. Uh, there's also an exchange and there's a difference between a brokerage and an exchange. Uh, and then there's also a commerce product. On the developer side, they have uh, Coinbase Cloud, which uses, and, and this, I think when, when you ask the question, I, I, you probably will, which is, okay, here's what Coinbase does today. What are they going to do in the future? I think the way they're going to diversify their revenue stream is becoming the OS for Web3. Uh, and that's going to be done through Coinbase Cloud. I think they've put their money in the right places, plus international expansion. But um, there's there's a lot to unpack in what I just mentioned. Yeah, time. I mean, we could go a million different angles. I mean, the one that I was thinking about in general is, you know, um, you shepherd the company, it goes public, it hits almost $100 billion valuation. I think we're around 30, 40 today. Still, that's a very large company market cap. Um, and if we know anything about markets is the success invites competition. Um, and so, you know, what is it particularly about Coinbase today that really, um, or the last few years that, that differentiates, differentiates itself from, you know, potential uh, competitors, incumbents like big shops entering and because a lot of these early adopters have had pretty fat margins on um, you know, the revenue model, what, what is sort of the, the main um, pieces that, that really drive it being a unique uh, and more importantly, uh, an entity that will survive and thrive? Sure. Great question. Um, make no mistake about it. Coinbase is the most expensive platform out there. And you touched upon just a, you know, a simple economic uh, phenomenon, which is which is uh, pricing, you know, pricing quantity is uh, you know, inversely related. So the more expensive you are, the less you're going to get. But the thing is, um, Coinbase really, the reason I think that they've been so successful and successful is, is I think just a, that's a terrible word for them. <laughs> they've been wildly successful. Um, when I was there, they spent $0, 0.00 dollars on sales and marketing, nothing. There was no performance marketing. There was no, awareness campaigns this was all done word of mouth and when i joined we were getting maybe 10,000 new uh new user signups per day and it started growing and growing and growing and, and at our peak we got over 400,000 users user signups in one day so the number one app on the or finance app on the app store for maybe a year running and why people felt so i mean these were when dinner conversations and i were i was a participant in many of these dinner conversations were dominated by this crypto phase or uh, you know, fantasy and pe people wanted to know all about it and pe you know, people didn't know what they were doing. It was like the tulip boom in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, you know, people didn't know about it. You know, they still think that it's, it's not legal tender and there's, you know, this is just, this, it's, it's a, it's a intangible you can't touch. Um, but what Coinbase did is they played nice with the regulators and they were the only U S based exchange or broker that uh, people here in the United States could could go to, knowing that they went through the reg regulatory hurdles, like uh, obtaining their their New York DFS bit license, which is probably the most restrictive of all states. They're a money transmitter at their core, and they have to get licensed in every state separately. Uh, so each state, you know, we we'll get back to regulations. It's a patchwork at best. Um, but then you know the, they also got their bit license in the UK. Um, and when, so they were a trusted, they were a trusted provider. They uh, took security very, very, um, uh, and compliance very seriously. It's embedded in the culture, uh, you go through training 
when you, when you start as an employee. And when, when customers are looking for, you know, when they're, they're examining and, and comparing various options, they look at really, you know, five or six different dimensions. One is fees, of course, but on their Coinbase consumer side, they're extremely expensive. It's, you know, four to 6% of the trade is a fee. And when, when customers think that uh, they're, you know, this Bitcoin's on a run and they're going to make 4,000% return or, you know, 10X their money in two days, they don't really care that they spend 5%. And that's really what is benefiting Coinbase is that, that high uh, vo volatility and the speculative nature of the asset that's being traded. Coinbase is probably won't talk, talk about it publicly, but they're benefiting from that substantially. Um, the, uh, the other things that they, uh, that, that customers look at are currency selections. Mm -hmm. There's a currency selection process, which is very detailed. And if anybody's interested, they can go right onto their, the Coinbase website and look at their, their uh, digital asset listing framework, um, which I actually help, uh, help prepare. But um, the other thing is trading volume. So you want to work with a, uh, an exchange that has enough liquidity and velocity and enough uh, access to liquidity pools to trade, you know, to command a market. While I was there, it's interesting. Now, if, if you trade in any stock globally, if it's traded on multiple exchanges, there's instant price verification or discovery. Um, at the time, there could have been fractions of a cent differences between Coinbase and other exchanges and people were writing algorithms and high frequency traders were taking advantage of that. That's, that's gone now. But uh, again, Wild West days, that, that was there. So trading volume is important. So fees, currency selection, trading volume, payment methods. Um, Visa shut us down when I was there. It was a kind of a, uh, I'd say, a difficult relationship at best. Um, and now they're completely supportive of, of crypto, which is interesting how things change. But um, you know, ACH, Wire, no one can write a check and send a check to Coinbase. But you know, what are the payment methods to, um, to onboard and offboard fiat? And then the last, I think people are all, and by, by the way, I don't think this is the last in the order of priority, but security. They want to know that their crypto is going to be safe. It's not going to be hijacked. Um, I, I keep all my crypto at Coinbase. It's free. Uh, their wallet services are free. And basically, Coinbase is paying and, and uh, you know, fronting that cost or supporting, you know, my, my wallet. Now, they're probably staking my, my, uh, my Ethereum and, and other digital assets. I, I actually haven't uh, participated in their staking product, but security is super important. You know, so customers are looking for a large variety of, of cryptocurrency choices, a very simple user interface, high liquidity and quick trade settlement. And they'd like to avoid high fees, um, they can always go to Coinbase Pro, which is a lower lower fee structure, but they also want to avoid um, um, having to control their own user wallet, which is cumbersome. Um, you know, see that responsibility as somebody else, and then um, you know, get access to. Uh, uh, they, they like to avoid, you know, working with a firm that doesn't have access to a lot of altcoins or. or uh, cryptocurrencies or, or digital assets that are that could be on listed on other exchanges. Yeah. Um, so as we kind of you know look to the future, um, you have all these massive competing forces. You have at the same time regulatory sand shifting all the time. You have the potential future development of um, new products and ideas. So why don't you talk about a couple of those? Um, that you've referenced thus far in the conversation, and we could probably spend an entire show on some of them. Um, you want to mention Coinbase Cloud. You mentioned, um, you know, I know Coinbase has a, an entire sort of Coinbase Ventures arm, growth opportunities. As we look out to the horizon, so uh, other than just the Bitcoin crypto adoption uh, globally, what, what, what are the things you think that are the big fat opportunities where they're moving, sure. hopefully looking around the corner? Um, I think before we dive into that, it's super, this is a very important point. You know, there's the principal and agency model, right? In, in any type of trading. And, um, and it's important to point out that Coinbase acts as 
a principal in its consumer offerings and an agent in its institutional offerings. And for those that the two people that don't know the difference, you know, principal trading is when a broker completes uh, a consumer's or a customer's trade using their own inventory. Uh, and this is an extremely important component of Coinbase's trade execution strategy. So it provides instant clearing and settlement as long, along with eliminating transaction and mining fees since there's no blockchain activity that took place. So that's called an off-chain transaction. And, the, and, how, and how Coinbase limits its, its costs is to avoid going out to the blockchain every time you know, Joe or Sally want to buy $100 uh, worth of, of Bitcoin. What, what Coinbase does is have a treasury of digital assets and you buy, you buy from them, you sell, you sell to them. And so it's instantaneous trade. So there's, you know, price discovery, transaction, there's deep liquidity, they can move quickly. On the agency side, that involves a broker finding a counterparty to the customer's trade, which can include customers at other brokers shops, right? So principal trading allows brokers to also profit from that bid-ask spread because there is a bid-ask spread, but because it's not on the, um, it, it's not an, an agency model uh, on the consumer side, uh, Coinbase benefits. So when you're looking at their financials, they're getting, they're, they're avoiding mining costs and transaction costs, which are extremely expensive, especially in a, uh, a market that's rallying because under a proof of work uh, structure for Bitcoin, for example, everybody's competing for for miners to solve your problem, to to mine your your block of the blockchain. And Coinbase, like others, if they want to speed up execution and not make it a ten minute wait, uh, they want to get someone to uh, a miner to transact quickly. Uh, they'll pay up, they'll pay more transaction fees or mining fees. And that's a super interesting point. Um, also, uh, that provides for gains and losses on trades. Um, when I was there, they were fortunate enough to make, I shouldn't probably talk about it, but a lot of money um, on the gain on digital asset sales because overall the market was expanding. And when they were, when they were selling, they were selling uh, digital assets they had bought at a at a from 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 others at a lower price. So um, so so you know in agency trading, the broker's going to find someone else willing to buy or sell uh, that security or that asset at the same price as the counterparty, which is it's a slower process, and uh, and Coinbase would only make money off the bid ask spread. So that's kind of a background of you know how they built their products and and pricing. But on the consumer, so I'd like to break their products into three buckets, consumer, institutional, and developers. Um, and the consumer side, we talked about Coinbase consumer, it's the base offering, it's, it's clean, simple, easy, it's expensive. Uh, Coinbase Pro, it's a more advanced and less expensive product uh, geared toward the crypto day trader. And it gives, it gives users advanced uh, and advanced traders, you know, charting and trading options. It gives them more control over their trading experience. Other products they have, and uh, this happened just while I was there, I was just exiting, but they offered along with Circle, a uh, USD coin, uh, which is a, a stable coin backed by the US dollar. And it, and it functions like cryptocurrency uh, and can be sent anywhere in the world for no fees. And so, you know, USDC represents fiat or government money on the blockchain, and it's redeemable on a one-to-one -one basis for US dollars. And it's, it's issued by you know, regulated financial institutions backed and fully reserved by assets which are you know, audited by you know, large accounting firms. And then we talked about the free service of Coinbase Wallet, which is, you know, it just helps users manage their own private keys and store their crypto assets you know, and so that they don't have to do it themselves. Uh, also Coinbase, after I left, uh, launched a, a debit card with, you know, supported by Visa and it lets uh, consumers spend any asset in their Coinbase portfolio with any merchant globally and can earn 4% uh, of crypto back, which so I'm kind of tempted to do it myself. Uh, there's no annual fees, there's no signup fees, uh, but the, Coinbase does charge a flat, roughly two and a half percent transaction fee for all purchases. So it's expensive um, because effectively what they're doing is they're trading crypto on your behalf. So for example, if you spent hundred dollars of Bitcoin with your Coinbase card in the United States, you'd be charged a fee of roughly $2.50. Um, so those are the consumer offerings. 
that, by the way, represent most of their revenue and, um, and not most of their trading value, but most of their revenue. On the institutional side, they have Coinbase Prime and Coinbase Commerce. And Coinbase Prime is a, like I said, it's a, it, it's a platform designed specifically to provide a suite of tools and a suite of services for institutional investors or the day traders even that, you know, when they're, when they're trading cryptocurrency. So it fills a missing piece of a critical infrastructure um, uh, that, uh, that institutions need. So this is the prime offering for, they, they, attract, uh, they attract corporate customers and liquidity providers. So Coinbase Prime for corporate customers it's an institutional great solution. It's, um, you know, the companies are looking to add or manage digital assets as part of their corporate treasury strategy. On the liquidity provider side, Coinbase Prime provides APIs and a trading platform, you know, to give these market makers and other high frequency traders the tools they need to trade crypto. So, you know, Prime is, a, you know, they have lending and margin products for qualified clients. So that takes several days to get qualified to go through the AML KYC process. Um, and through, you know, through that offering, um, you know, Coinbase offers kind of high touch execution services like their OTC trading desk. Um, they give their customers algorithm, you know, ability to process algorithmic, algorithmic orders, as well as provide them with market data and research products. They also recently introduced um, platform, pl some platform improvements to allow things like, like multi-user permissions and whitelisted withdrawal addresses, that type of thing. Coinbase OTC, like I mentioned before, which is part of their exchange offering, is the only agency-only trading desk. And that allows you know, smart order routing, routing, advanced algorithms, post-trade transaction analysis, and it really helps these investors manage their, their execution needs. As part of their prime offering, they also offer Coinbase custody, which uh, actually I built the business model around. And uh, Coinbase custody is, it's, part, it's free uh, on, uh, for, as part of their, or it's, I shouldn't say it's free, it's part of their prime offering. It was launched in 2018 and it was really geared to provide, you know, secure digital asset storage for institutional investors. And you know it's, it's a critical service because large institutions uh, are not allowed to self custody crypto assets in the amounts above, I believe it's $500 million. So the service is super important and it opens a secure gateway to allow these institutional investors and hedge funds and others that want to be in the cryptocurrency space, but uh, they can't self custody. So like I said, I, I prepared the business case, uh, came up with the pricing, I believe they have over seven billion dollars in custody today, and that was, uh, I believe, through wow. the acquisition of a of, a, of another player um, called Zappos. And then Commerce, like I talked about, it's an enterprise blockchain service that facilitates you know, cryptocurrency transactions between customers and merchants, you know, like Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, etc. And um, there's not a lot of companies taking crypto these days. You probably read about Tesla. And others, Dell, others, uh, you know, uh, accept crypto, but the problem is, how do you how do you process a return if you're a consumer grade product? So that's still being ironed out. So I think that's that's uh, something something that's going to happen in the future. Um, the next is in the, the products that they have for developers, and this is a re recent launch, and I wasn't there, but I think this is a fascinating play. In fact. We, we, we had quarterly strategic meetings when I was there and we were all tasked, here I was the newcomer to crypto and we were all tasked with, you know, what's the next thing? What could we do next? And I, like a dummy said, hey, we're really good at, at um, security and, and custody and compliance uh, and following regulations. Why don't we do what, a, what Amazon does and build uh, AWS for crypto? And that was, you know, people kind of took notice, I guess. And now they're actually doing it. I don't want to say that I started it, but, um, but it's, a, it's an interesting product. All of, their all of their revenue today, not all of it, roughly 80% of it it's, uh, is, is non-recurring, right? It's transaction fees. And most of that comes out of the consumer side. And we could talk about their revenue, you know, sources of revenue in a minute. But Coinbase Clouds, Cloud gives them not only a recurring revenue stream, uh, through a subscription model, 
but it, it does it through offering developers an on-ramp for building these crypto applications and services and speeds up their development timelines and allows their development teams to focus on improving their product instead of managing a crypto infra infrastructure, which Coinbase is really good at. So Coinbase wants Coinbase Cloud to be the AWS of cryptocurrency, providing you know, blockchain infrastructure in the same way that AWS provides hosted cloud computing and APIs for the web. So um, there's, you know, users can do a lot. They can trade with their exchange API. Um, so developers can, can power high volume crypto trading with, uh, with, the, with Coinbase exchange API, you know, accessing deep liquidity pools, managing accounts, getting market data, that type of thing. They can also, users can accept crypto payments with their commerce API, what we just talked about, um, providing the convenience and the speed of crypto transactions, accepting crypto payments. It, it currently requires secure and reliable infrastructure, which it makes no sense for other companies to build. Why not, why not lever what, what Coinbase has already built? Um, crypto asset issuers can also simplify how they interact with multiple blockchains. And for those that aren't familiar with just blockchain technology, there's a lot of different blockchain technologies and they're very difficult. These cross-chain products and services uh, are quite complex and they need to be integrated. Um, and that's probably the most challenging task for, for um, these, these altcoin or, or crypto or digital asset developers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, each blockchain has a different set of rules and go that governs the transactions and you know, Coinbase users can you know, use this open source project, I believe it's called Rosetta, and they get access to, um, you know, to their integrating their, their, their blockchain and crypto products that, you know, that any other blockchains that, that, that touch or, or are interfaced with Rosetta. And then um, developers can also easily connect their wallets to their dApps using their wallet SDK. Uh, and this is an open source SDK and a lot of developers, you know, connect their dApps to millions of, of Coinbase wallet users. So, you know, that includes, you know, all their digital assets, their NFTs, and it just makes a simple onboarding and transaction, uh, uh, transacting um, uh, method for both mobile and web. And last, the Coinbase cloud makes it easy to onboard customers so you can sign in with Coinbase, which lets developers use the Coinbase APIs and you know, take things like permissionless actions on behalf of their customers. You know, this is for buying and selling and depositing and withdrawing crypto. And that just delivers a really a, a seamless customer experience. Um, you mentioned other things like mm -hmm. Coinbase Ventures. That was something that started when I was there also. And um, Emily Choi, who's now their president, was you know, came, on, came in from LinkedIn and she ran corporate development at LinkedIn and, and now kind of moved from corporate development at, at Coinbase into, you know, she built Coinbase Ventures. It's, really, it's, it's, it's not a, a separate legal entity. It's, it's, it's an on balance sheet investment arm of Coinbase and they invest in early stage cryptocurrency and blockchain startups. One thing that's super fascinating here, Meb, is that Coinbase plants its flag in every corner of the, of the crypto sector. They plant their flag in competitive sectors. We'll talk about decentralized exchanges. They bought one. Uh, we we you know we we talked about um, you know investing now into other players uh, in in the crypto sector and why that's fascinating is you know all boats rise in a rising tide they like to see not only all of these other startups uh, grow and they typically were following or at least when I was there were following Andreessen Horowitz's lead uh, but I think they went further and they're investing uh, much much more broadly. I don't know exactly how much they put to work, but that also acts as an incubator for future acquisitions, which by the way, um, my new company, we're going to take a play, page out of that playbook and probably set up a, a company I'm with now. It's called Crexy. We're probably going to be setting up a Crexy Ventures. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating idea and it, it's, it's, it, it, well, it's good. I, I want, I want to hop over to Crexy uh, next before we wind down the uh, Coinbase chapter. Is there a particular moment, experience, um, good, bad in between, but that, that uh, you recall from your time there um, that really just kind of like burned in your brain or that you think is like a, uh, as you reflect back a, a moment that, um, you either with fondness or anxiety, I don't know, but what's anything in particular, a story that you remember from your time at Coinbase? I'm sure there's a lot. Oh, there's many. Um, 
some you know make your hair curl and some were like just an awe um i didn't know what a fork was or an airdrop and you know that creates all kinds of custody and ownership issues when you know just randomly someone decides for every owner of bitcoin you're going to be an owner of timcoin or a clam <laughs> or whatever mm -hmm. and now how do you trade and track that uh, who owns that is it did is Coinbase on it or is, is the, is the customer on it? And I don't want to get into the details there, but that created a lot of uh, legal uh, headaches. The other thing is, you know, getting audited. Um, no big four auditor would audit us because they didn't know how to determine the gain or loss on digital assets. Um, they didn't know if it was real. They didn't even know how to, what they ended up doing is setting up their own nodes on the blockchain infrastructure to be able to actually validate. These are the auditors to validate that these trades actually took place. And so um, the auditors now, I think, have got, uh, grown quite a bit. And you know, firms like Deloitte and EY are really leading the charge there. Um, but uh, th those are some super interesting things. Banking and access to capital, uh, those were some hair-raising moments. Uh, one, we were at the, uh, I remember, it was approaching the end of the year uh, in 2017 and these shopping mall banks called us and said, you've got to take your money out of our bank. And we didn't know where to put it. We tried and tried and tried. No one would accept it. None of the, none of the big money center banks would accept it. So we were freaking. And uh, you know, this is one of a hundred stories. But what we ended up doing was setting up an account with the Federal Reserve and the US government had no problem taking it. This was about $4 billion of fiat. And so um, we went from not making any money with these money center or these little shopping mall banks to getting Federal Reserve uh, interest on, you know, one, two, three, and four week uh, laddered uh, treasuries. So I think that, that's just a, a taste of a, of a few things that um, we uncovered. But, you know, the, the amount of just the amount of capital and cash that we're receiving, I told, uh, I told Brian one day, I was joking, we were the last two people in the office and he said, and what are you doing here so late? And I said, well, I'm, I'm trying to find a truck. And he said, well, why do you need a truck? And I said, well, do you know how much a million dollars in cash weighs and hundred dollar bills? And he kind of thought about it for a while. And, and uh, he said, no, I'm guessing uh, 50 pounds. I said, and it's 22 pounds. And I, my estimation, we're going to need four semis to mm -hmm. <laughs> move all this money to some bank. And I'm joking, mm -hmm. obviously, that was not a real, uh, real activity, but that's the, those are the kinds of things that we were faced with. As, as you were talking about Armstrong late at night, I thought you were going to be the one that was just talking politics. And he's like, you know what, I've had enough of this. I'm going to write this memo and being like, no one talking politics anymore at, uh, at this, uh, at this company. Tim's been in my ear too much about it. No, um, that wasn't me. Yeah, I'm just kidding. So you decide not to just go full sabbatical and ski for the rest of your life. Um, you decided to look south to the land of milk and honey here in Los Angeles to a little company up the road in Marina del Rey. Tell me uh, what drew you to these guys, what they're doing, and if there's any uh, similarities to uh, this Coinbase, Coinbase story. Yeah, there actually are. It's a totally different asset class. It's much larger. I think globally, digital assets are valued, you know, have a market cap of roughly $2 billion, depending on the volatility of the day. Um, what, where I'm, I'm, we're, I'm working in a company called Crexy now. Uh, it's based in LA. It's an early stage company. We just closed a Series B financing. I can't get into details, but it was um, quite a win. And it's a marketplace for buying and selling and leasing commercial real estate. You know, think of it like Zillow for commercial real estate, but it's not like Zillow at all, but it's easier for people to think about that. Um, the reason that I joined was I got through my time at, at Coinbase, I just got excited about the exchange business mm -hmm. and, you know, how much you know, people buy. Exchanges make money when people buy and sell and people are always buying and selling every piece of real estate. Is, a, is available or commercial real estate is up for sale at some price. So the, the, how I got interested, I got call another call from a recruiter who I've known for years and they wanted to talk to me about this little company in, in LA. It's, um, it's in commercial real estate, you know, commercial real estate exchange. It's early stage. It hasn't raised a lot of money. It's, it didn't have a built out finance function. Um, and 
I thought, well, I live in the Bay Area. Um, how, come I, how can I build an organization in LA, a finance organization? I don't know anything about commercial real estate. Um, and I don't want to commute to LA or move to LA. So, so I thought about it, I passed. And then um, the recruiter presented me to, uh, to the CEO, uh, Mike DiGiorgio. And Mike's an active crypto trader. And she presented me and he wanted to talk to me. And so just out of respect for the, for the, um, the recruiter, I took the, the, took the call and, um, and we talked for about, it was a 90 minute call. We talked for about, I don't know, 40 minutes, 50 minutes on crypto. And that it, it was fascinating. We, we had, a, we, we, it was, it was great. And uh, we didn't talk at all about commercial real estate. And then he started talking about commercial real estate. We, we extended the call. It, it became uh, more like a two hour call. Uh, but at the end of the call, I was like, wow, this is super interesting. This is an asset class that's, that's not digitized. And it's, um, you know, I wanted to learn more. So we set up, a, we set up another, uh, another call and I walked through how I thought I could help him. And I want to learn more about what, what's going on here. This is a huge asset class. So let me kind of step back. This will take about two minutes. Um, globally, it's valued that global wealth, that's the wealth of every person alive, is about $380 trillion, $280 trillion, 75% of that is real estate. That's bigger than the M1 and M2 money supply combined. It's massive. It's the largest asset class. A large portion of that is residential. So take away residential globally, plus or minus $100 billion. It's about a six, uh, $70 trillion global asset class. And it's paper-based. It hasn't gone digital. And if you look at that, what is the United States? It's about 16, 16, 17 trillion. So commercial real estate is one of the world's largest asset class. It's currently illiquid. It's underserved. It's not digitized. And so what Crexie has built and is continuing to build, it's a, call it a new age marketplace for commercial real estate. If you were to want to buy a piece of commercial, commercial real estate, as broadly speaking, is everything that's not residential. So assisted living centers, mobile home parks, self-storage units, hospitals, you know, post offices, you know, people just talk about regular offices, but that's a very small portion of total, you know, drive down Sepulveda or any, uh, you know, Wilshire Boulevard in LA and every single building is commercial real estate. Someone owns it to make a return on their investment. And so it's a massive asset class. It's not digitized. If you wanted to buy a piece of property, it would take you nine months to close that deal. You'd pay a huge load on the, um, uh, from a broker, and you'd be working with a broker that has regional knowledge, so limited information and asymmetric information flow. So what Crexi has built is a platform that serves both the sale and lease markets, and it provides market intelligence and, and forecasts and predictive analytics for both buyers and sellers. Um, the software improves the speed, efficiency, and liquidity of, of transactions that's completed on the platform. And over time, I think the platform is going to allow investors to buy real estate as easily as they buy uh, stock on the stock market today. And I'm old enough to know what the stock market used to be when the New York Stock Exchange ran around a piece of paper and people traded on paper and then they sent you a paper stock certificate. Now you go to... Um, you know, TD Ameritrade or Schwab and hit a button, instantly you own your shares of Apple or Google and you can sell them instantly uh, for almost zero load fee. So, um, or fee load. The, um, you know, so what, what, uh, what we're doing is building not only a, a platform and a marketplace, you know, a free marketplace, but also a paid marketplace to get advanced uh, performance as well as an analytics platform, which is a separate revenue stream, and then a transactions team to be able to actually take over the whole transaction and, and um, help a, a seller sell their, their property uh, quickly and predictably. So it's game changing. You know, when you compare the analog version of commercial real estate investment currently being used and, you know, uh, Mark Andreessen wrote, wrote a, a great uh, paper 10 years ago, how software is eating the world and software hasn't eaten this world yet. So there's, there's, it's a massive, you know, it, it eclipses the digital asset uh, market cap and there's billions of dollars that are going to be created when software solves this old school problem. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, um, I'll tell you a funny story. 
I invest in a lot of startups and real estate is one of my favorite spots because it is so calcified and antiquated and it's everything a, a startup investor wants. It has an enormous TAM, right? Like one of the big, like you mentioned, one of the biggest markets in the world that still is operated on a friggin' like yellow pad, right? Half the yeah. time. And so exactly. I'm, and from someone who's actually been not really traditionally been in that world, but we talk a lot on this podcast on the benefits of real assets and how they should be a big part of a portfolio. Um, I'm keen to, to look at deals. I actually saw Crexy come across my plate uh, on a, on an angel list syndicating part of the, um, and I was very interested in it. My problem is now going back to the real estate discussion is that uh, I have no money because we're renovating my house and listeners have heard me moan about this for a couple months. And so uh, that process, uh, very romantic ahead of time, very uh, hair, hair pulling, uh, you know, going through it, which everyone warned me about. So I understand, but, but it's funny that that I'm always amazed that that world hasn't um, like teleported or leaped forward faster over the past 20 years. Cause it seems so ripe for disruption uh, that it's just kind of bananas in my mind. So um, that might have to be a company that we even uh, chat up on the podcast one day. Cause I love yeah, uh, It's fascinating. You're, you're absolutely right. It's um, it's ripe for disruption. Uh, the problem is you, you can't be too fast. Like there's companies that uh, like crowd street tried to fractionalize real estate. They blew through hundred million dollars. The market's not ready for it. You have to knock down the dominoes in the right order yeah. Uh, the beauty of what Mike did when he started the company, he took a broker friendly approach. They're the ones that are actually paying uh, our, you know, paying fees to use our, our platform. This is a, this is a 10 year transition. This is not going to happen, you know, the next two years. And where I think this is going to go is, is re- these are real assets. They're perfect for NFTs or, um, you know, applying uh, blockchain technology to ownership records and it's also perfect for, you know, we can eliminate escrow completely because the transaction could take place instantaneous. The only reason escrow is there is to hold the money while a pile of paper is being reviewed and signed. And so, and title, obviously this is, you know, property records that will go digital. We're, there's, I don't know if you know this, but there's no multiple listing for commercial. We want to become mm-hmm. that multiple listing. Uh, service. So have property records on every single property and not only the current record, but historical records to know occupancy rates, mortgage defaults, everything about that property, number of sunny days, what the foot traffic is by the front door, you know, you name it and talk about machine learning and providing data science and what that means for determining the value of that property. By the way, when you value a piece of property, it's not based on your, the guy that sold the property next door, it's the underbids that lost. That's the real market. And we have that information. So I just think this could be massive. Tim, my God, we could uh, we could talk for hours, you and I. I feel like uh, we we just, next time on a chairlift, we just got to hit record and then we'll just record uh, yeah. and have uh, the There's really happy, the happy, right, the happy hour discussion. But I've held you for a while. Um, as you reflect back, you've been CFO at a number of different shops. I imagine there's been many a moment. So we'll, we'll include uh, not just Coinbase, but all the companies over the years. Um, what's been sort of your most memorable moment, um, you know, through, through these companies thick and thin, uh, it could be good, bad in between anything come to mind. Um, yeah. Um, I, uh, the first, you know, I just, as a, as a, I didn't grow up with, uh, you know, with wealth, uh, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, um, never felt poor, but never had any money. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the day I deposited the first million dollars into my bank account, that was maybe the most memorable moment of my, my career. Um, uh, and that, uh, that was at COVID and, um, and, you know, ringing the bell in the New York Stock Exchange several times, um, super memorable, um, the, cool, the coolest thing about the New York Stock Exchange um, to me is not the bell. It's the conference room, uh, yes. boardroom table they have, which must be like 50 feet long. It's like a Vladimir like, Putin table, right? The, it's like with the, there's a Fabergé egg at the end, right? That's just ridiculously like long. Tall. 
um but uh but an experience just to go visit it's it's, it's like quickly becoming a museum at this point now that everything's going digital but yes. um yes. a super fun experience well you know th that moment um you know having those mindset of uh scarcity and then abundance on the money side you know is is actually a pretty hard transition for a lot of people um you know, uh, I, my, my dad grew up, you know, really poor as a farmer and, and got to see this firsthand, but a lot of people, uh, that moment can be, uh, elation. It can be like, you know, like a, like a sigh, like, okay, I can, I can breathe now. And others, it can be, um, a letdown, you know, you talk, you look, listen to a lot of company founders and, and they sell their company and they get, you know, depressed for a few months which 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 uh which spectrum emotions do you have you, it sounds like you know, you're more the sigh <laughs> you know um it's funny that you say that because I, I really never talked to anybody about this but um you know when you chase the brass ring and you finally get it you, what do you do next it's like the dog chasing the car you know they, yeah. they, they caught the car what do you do now and i went through a, a couple of years where it was like what do i do now and I actually took four years off, you know, had another ch child, uh, coached Little League and T-ball and basketball and soccer. And I was the Cub Scout leader and all of that stuff. And um, it went from, honey, can you pick up the kids to, you need to pick up the kids at this time. I was like, okay, it's time to go back to work. So I, um, I yeah, it was a sigh, but one, I guess, you know, everybody has regrets. And one of the regrets I, I have is getting out of the game. I got back in, but there's, there's, it, it's, I, don't, I, I, you know, some people work to live and other people live to work. Um, and I'm, I, th I think I live to work. I yeah. really enjoy it. I like being around other people. I take pride in, in um, mentoring younger professionals. Uh, several people that have reported to me are now CFOs of their own right, or in fact, two of them become CEOs of their own companies. And so I just really love it and uh, love the intellectual challenge. And it's, it's, uh, you know, working, working around people of like mind. Uh, and I le learned that is that life's too short to be around people you don't like. So yeah, uh, yeah, it's the old, the old Hemingway quote, only work with people you love. Easy to say, hard to do, of course, but, um, but look, well, you know, there's been, a lot of, it's been a great conversation and I, uh, I feel like yeah. we only scratch the surface, by the way. I there's... know. Well, you know, there's a lot of nobility and uh, purpose and work. And I'm, I'm like you. I mean, well, you, you depend on the day you catch me. So most days I'm tap dancing work. Other days I'm uh, going insane. But that's the agony and ecstasy of working in entrepreneurs and kind of the, the ventures we choose to. Um, if uh, it, two more questions. One, what's your, what's your bucket list ski destination? You got any in mind you've never been to that's uh, been sitting on your plate yes, for a while? Yes. So you and I skied in Japan, which was a bucket mm -hmm. list. And I, I brought my, uh, my son who loved it and still talks about it. I think you nicknamed him chips because he was already the only thing he could <laughs> eat in, uh, in Japan that he knew were, were potato chips. Yeah. Um, but that was, that was outrageously fun. And, you know, for the, for the listeners, um, yeah, I grew up skiing. I ski raced uh, as, a, as a youth. I didn't make it onto the national team. So I ski raced professionally. I tried at least number one. I came in second once, but uh, so I have a you know, history of skiing. All my kids love skiing. And the next one, the bucket list is uh, the Alps. And, you know, maybe we'll do it with you. Uh, yeah, they let us in next year. I'm game, man. We'll, we'll put that on the to-do list. Um, yeah, that to me would be skiing from one country to another and taking the train, and, then the gondola, then the tram, then the chairlift. And then fondue the and wine. That's that's there, more yeah, I'm, that's, I'm interested in. The beer, fondue, and wine. That's a Pasta at lunch. Um, yeah, yeah. People want to get in touch with you. They say, you know what, Tim, we need to recruit you to our new uh, startup company. They want to chat with you about the blockchain, any, anything. Is there a place where people can find you? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm still uh, much of a beginner on um, you know, setting up a, a YouTube channel or um, you know, having a kind of a, my own website. But uh, that, 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 this conversation makes me want to do that, which I'll be probably setting up. And because uh, I've, you know, I've got my LinkedIn profile, for example, I wrote a three-part series on how blockchain is impacting the role of the CFO. And so I've got a lot of thoughts and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, ideas to share and experiences to share. And um, 
uh, I would, um, you know, certainly love it if people reached out to me uh, individually, even on my personal email. I might want to change that later because it might it might get too crowded. But uh, simple, uh, it's Tim at Leahy dot com. Uh, that's L A E H Y dot com. And we're, um, you know, I'll, uh, if that gets overcrowded, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll set up a YouTube channel. Yeah. Well, listeners, uh, be, uh, be thoughtful about uh, the generosity of, of passing along his, his contact information. Um, Tim, it's been a whirlwind tour. Uh, it's been a blast. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Absolutely. It was, it was enjoyable and my pleasure.